Welcome to episode 18 of I Thought I Knew How, a podcast about knitting and life and all sorts. I'm your host, Anne Frost, and this episode was recorded on November 4th, 2019. Today I'd like to talk to you about the classes that I took at Shetland Wool Week. Wovember and a few more things. I have some music for you this episode, and I'd like to gauge your interest in a I Thought I Knew How Knit Along in the New Year. Before I get into the actual official classes that I took while I was at the Wool Week event, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that most of the instructors for Wool Week live in Shetland. There were a few things that I was interested in, but they conflicted with classes I really wanted to do. In one instance, I knew that we were going to be there a week early, so I just reached out to the teacher and asked if she'd be willing to just teach me. In this case, she was. So we met Cheryl Jamison in her house and did a fused glass project at her kitchen table. In this case, it allowed enough time for her to fire the pieces in the kiln, and we were able to pick them up from her workshop space at Wool Week. Also, Loose Ends hosted some knitting classes. I believe there was a tour company offering tours separate from Wool Week, and one of the fellows running one of the experiences told us to spread the word that he was willing to take extra people if anyone was feeling downtrodden about missing the attendance cutoffs. I say all this to drive home the point that just because you may not get tickets to a specific official event, there is still plenty to do on Shetland relating to wool and knitting and weaving, including opportunities for instruction. The best thing you can do is just ask. I found people to be very accommodating when there was any way to make it happen. As for the classes I was in, there are nine days of classes offered at Shetland Wool Week. I had signed up for classes on seven of them, but ended up selling my class on the first day because it was an introduction to Fair Isle. And after having knit all those hats before I got there, I felt like I was probably past needing the introductory help. So my classes actually started on Monday instead of Saturday. I think I mentioned in the last episode that I ended up with quite a few classes and experiences. I will not try to cram so much in next time. I do actually regret not having so much free time. That was a valuable part of the experience that I missed out on this last year, so lesson learned. That said, my first class started on Monday with Jeanette Budge and Jeannie Tullock. My interview with Jeanette went out in episode 15, so many of you already know how informative she is. She and her mother designed a little knit bag to use as a way to teach some basic Fair Isle color theory and yoke shaping, but Jeanette and Jeannie spent the entire class sharing information about Fair Isle. Because it was so early in the week, everyone was still full of excitement and had a million questions, and they all were answered. Of all the classes I took, I think this one was actually the most generally informative. I ended up making a bag knit with grays and blues and did not actually love the color progression I came up with for it. But one of the reasons for knitting the bag is to have a way to swatch and test for gauge and how the colors work together and still end up with something useful instead of a swatch you'll never look at again. So even though I'm not in love with the colors for a future sweater yoke, it did make a pretty little drawstring bag and taught me the fundamentals of yoke design. So mission accomplished. If this teaching team offers a different class next year, I'm going to try to get into it because they really are quite good. The next day, I had a steaking class with Barbara Chain. I sort of wonder if Barbara is a former school teacher. Of all the teachers I had in the week, Barbara seemed like she had traditional classroom experience. This was the class I was really looking forward to. I wanted to learn how to steek while I was in Shetland, and we did get to steek. We knit a Fair Isle tube that was about two inches high, cut it, and then on one edge, Barbara showed us the traditional method for steeking, and on the other, she showed us the crochet method. Unfortunately, in a three-hour class, we spent about two and a half hours knitting the swatch, and then in the last 30 minutes or so, Barbara was trying to get around to all of us and show us the two different methods for steeking, and it was a bit of a rush. In the traditional method, you roll the cut edge back on itself so that the cut edges of the yarn are hidden and then sort of whip stitch the edge of that to the floats on the wrong side. With the crocheted version, you take your crochet hook and slip stitch through the edge of two stitches all the way down in two columns and then cut between those columns. The crocheted slip stitch becomes a sharper edge that you can use to fold along and it holds the cut stitches more securely so you can make do with 
a narrower steak because you don't have to tuck so many back under itself. It's a cleaner looking steak and less bulky. And I think it's how I'll do it going forward. But unfortunately, it's such a short experience that I'll have to hop onto YouTube for a refresher before I steak again. I did enjoy this class and Barbara as a teacher, but I think it would have been helpful to maybe have been given the pattern for the knitting tube before the class so we could come in and start steaking right away and then maybe have had some machine knit tubes available for us to try it again a few more times because neither of my steaks was something to be proud of. I definitely need to practice a few more times before I steak the Harriet's cowl that I'm working on. So those were my Monday and Tuesday classes. Let's stop and have a break for a moment. This month over on Instagram, there is a posting prompt event going on called Wovember. The purpose of the event is to spread the word about the benefits and properties of wool, why we use it, why we love it. If you'd like to check it out, hop over to Instagram and search for the hashtag Wovember, which is spelled just like November, only starting with a W. The prompt for day five, which is when this episode will launch, is wool and art. And I really look forward to seeing all the paintings and sculptures and such that people will post over there about wool and art. But I thought that with an audio podcast, it might be fun to explore some wool in the musical arts. The first song I'm going to play for you was written by Johann Sebastian Bach for the birthday celebration of Christian, the Duke of Saxe-Weisenfels. It's a cantata for a soprano. The words are being sung by Pales, which I think is how you pronounce the name. It might be Pallas, who was the Roman god of shepherds, flocks, and livestock. And in the cantata, Pales draws a comparison between contented sheep and the people living under a wise ruler. The words to the song are... Sheep may safely graze and pasture in a watchful shepherd's sight. Those who rule with wisdom guiding bring to hearts a peace abiding, bless a land with joy made bright. So, Buck clearly knew his audience. <laughs> in this version, and in most of the versions of this song I've heard before, though, it's just the melody. This is Sheep May Safely Graze by Johann Sebastian Bach. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wednesday was a busy day. It started with a class with Cecil of Pepperwark Furniture. We went to the Big Tin Hall, and he had set up a little wood shop for us all to whittle our own shawl pin. The design of the pin was the sort where you have a piece like a donut with a hole in the center large enough to pull some of your shawl through, and then you use a stick pin to pass through that bit of your shawl to secure it in place. What the donut-shaped bit looked like and what the stick pin-shaped part looked like were up to your imagination. He had a lot of different wood that we could choose from, and I picked some that was from a reclaimed old church organ, and I used it to design a pin shaped like the head of a sheep. There were some saws available for us to cut out our general designs, and then we whittled away at them, shaping them and rounding the edges until they were close to how we wanted. There were all sorts of different tools available for the whittling, but I actually ended up using a box cutter, which was very effective. Once the shape was close, we went at them with sandpaper for (laughs) ages and ages, but once they were oiled, I actually felt like maybe I needed to go at it with sandpaper a little bit more, but time was pretty much up by then. Still, I am quite pleased with my little sheepy head, and I really enjoyed the class. It was a nice, tangentially knitting-related project that gave me a mental break from all the knitting. That afternoon, though, it was back to knitting at Uredale Farm with Maria and Hilly of Troll and Wool for an introduction to Bohus knitting. Bohus is a type of stranded color work that can use up to seven colors in the same row, and also incorporates purl stitches. So you know when you have to change colors in garter stitch and you end up with a row of lines at the transition point where you have your first color and then a row of vertical lines of the next color and then a row of vertical lines in the first color and then the second color takes over. Boha's knitting takes advantage of the nature of colorwork pearls to produce some interesting texture and color effects. The pattern we worked was for a pair of short Bohus leg warmers, and I love them. They are knit in the Uredale organic wool, which is amazing stuff. And because it was an intro level class, it just got us used to purling in color work. But the leg warmers are warm, and the information they shared was intriguing enough that I hope to take the intermediate class next year. If you bought the Wool Week annual, there's actually a mitten pattern in there that employs Bohus knitting techniques. So have a peek at that and maybe give it a go. Thursday was an all-day class at the Hoswick Visitor Center, and in all honesty, I found it frustrating. It was knitting a mini Shetland hap with Ann Yunsen and Kathleen Anderson. I would like to say, first of all, that they are both great teachers, and they produce some truly stunning lace work. If you can take a class with them, I recommend it. My problem with the class was partly the location and partly the amount of prep work we were given. Um, It combined to make the class less than effective, unfortunately. First of all, the class was held in a side space of the Hoswick Visitor Center, which is a great little community center, cafe, museum, shop space uh, in the middle of Hoswick. And it's great. If you do get to Shetland, be sure that you stop by. The food was yummy and the displays were interesting. The classroom itself was bright and airy and it had good amounts of space for our group. The problem was that it was a lace class and at one point there was an open spin group scheduled for part of the time that we were there. So they had about one third of the room and were understandably happy to be together and chatty and enjoying each other, which made it very difficult to stay focused on the lace. I kept losing track of where I was in the pattern. It was very frustrating. And again, I don't blame the spinners, and I don't think the organizers even really realized what a conflict it would cause, but it was a problem for quite a few of us in the class. Second, we weren't given any prep work for the class, and I think we really should have been. With the style of hap we were learning, you knit the border lace first, And then you pick up a quarter of the stitches along the edge of the border and knit a trapezoid-shaped piece onto it. You repeat that four times, and then on the top of the last trapezoid, you keep knitting so that you end up with a square on top. Then you attach it all by connecting the slanted edges of the trapezoid parts together and the other three edges of the square to the top of the other trapezoids. And voila, then you have a shawl. The square becomes the middle, the four trapezoids come out and form the midsection, and then the lace that you started with becomes the edging. But to do any of that, 
you had to get the lace edging done. Most of us got far enough along to hit the halfway point of the lace edging, which was enough to stop working on that and start working on the trapezoid sections. I'm a fairly quick knitter, and I got through one and a half of the trapezoid sections. Now, there are ladies in the class who got very close to being done, but they were working on the smaller of the two options that we had, and they were there early, and they had lots of experience with lace. Most of us didn't get anywhere near halfway through, and we were knitting for six hours. I really, really wish that we'd been told to knit the lace edging before we arrived. That should have allowed us enough time to start at the point where we were picking up the stitches for the intersections, and that's really where the instruction should have begun. It wasn't an introduction to lace knitting class. The point of the class was to learn the unique construction method, and we just didn't make it to that point. So yeah, that was my big frustration of the week, and I think it could have easily been solved by just having us knit that border first. Also, I have heard A few teachers talk about how in past years they get people in their classes who don't have the appropriate skills to be there. I think the pre-class assignments are a good way for people to assess for themselves if they know what they need to know before they arrive. So for instance, knitting the tube for the steaking class would have helped someone to know that maybe they should take a fair isle class first before they worry about steaking. And if someone couldn't manage the five row repeat of the shawl edging for the knitting a hap, Maybe a beginner's lace class would have been more suitable for them than focusing on hap construction. I don't know if it's that the teachers are worried that people would feel overburdened with pre-class work, or if they are afraid of people taking their ideas and using them to teach their own workshops or what, but I think that with some of the classes anyway, that pre-class work is a very important time saver for the class itself and a money saver for the student who may not be ready for the class and wouldn't realize she's not ready until the day. Anyway, I did get some video of Anne assembling a hap, and I'll turn to YouTube when it's time, but right now my partially finished hap is just sitting on its own waiting for a day when I can face it again. I would like to thank those of you who made it over to support the Shetland Peary Mackers at crowdfunder.co.uk slash Shetland Peary Mackers. I don't know how many of you did, but I do know that there's a space on that website where you can leave comments and there's a space where unless you check anonymous, when you make your donation, it will list your name. And I recognized quite a few of you as listeners to the podcast. So thank you for supporting the Shetland Peary Mackers. There are a few other fundraisers you might want to be aware of that are contributing to the Shetland MRI scanner appeal. The first one, it has just started. It is a knit-along being hosted by Morehouse Merino. If you go over to Facebook and join the Morehouse Merino flock, there is still time. It started November 1st, but it's for the fingerless mitts. It's really for any pattern in the Harriet's hat collection, but it just started, so there's still time for you to get over and start if you would like to be part of that fundraiser. Fundraiser. Of course, the price of the pattern is what goes to the fundraising. So if you go over to mrimackers.com, you can purchase the pattern for the hat, the gloves, the fingerless gloves, the headband, the mittens, or the new pattern for the cowl. So I have actually cast on two cowls and After I get this edited, I will be starting the fingerless glove. So even I'm behind on one of the three projects I want to be doing. But Erin at Morehouse Merino does a great job answering questions and holding your hands through the project. So that is a great place if you are new to Fair Isle Knitting and would like to try one of the Harriet's collection and support the MRI scanner appeal, that's a great place to join up. So the place again is over on Facebook. It's called the Morehouse Merino Flock. The other thing you might want to be aware of is that Jameson's of Shetland has invited people to knit baubles, so the little round Christmas decorations, to send into them to decorate their store window for the holiday season. That is going on until mid-November. So if you would like to do that, if you visit Jameson's of Shetland on Instagram, they have the information there on their account. The baubles take a couple hours to knit. You just stuff them with polyfill and then you can send them in. If you are located in the UK and you're listening to this within a few days of it posting, you may be able to get a few done and sent up to them. Why would you do this? Why would you help a store decorate their window for Christmas? Well, 
they have asked the MRI mackers if they would sell those baubles on their behalf once the holidays are over. So in the new year, all of those baubles are going to be posted online and sold with the proceeds going directly to the MRI scanner appeal. So be on the lookout for that. And again, if you would like to contribute, you need to get your baubles knit in the next few days um, and sent to them by mid-November. And again, I will have all the links for everything I've just talked about in the show notes at I thought I knew how dot family podcasts dot com. So Friday, I had two more classes. The first was with Allison Rendell, who was teaching her very first class at Wool Week. You may actually be familiar with her already if you're on Instagram. Her handle is Fair Isle Knitting with an underscore between each word. She posts a lot of lovely photos from around Shetland and of her finished items. She had mainly hats and gloves to pass around, as well as a few Fair Isle dresses that she's knit that were just lovely. Anyway, the class was called Macking a Fair Isle cuff. If you've bought the fingerless glove pattern from the Harriet's collection, then you probably know what I'm talking about. It's a common feature with Fair Isle gloves or mittens for the knitter to start by knitting a tube with a Fair Isle pattern on it, maybe about two inches long. And then that is flipped through the center of your needles so that the front of your work is now the back of your work. And then you carry on knitting as you'd knit a typical glove with two by two ribbing and then the glove or mitten body. But when you're done, you can take that first fair aisle tube that you knit at the beginning and flip it upwards and the fair aisle pattern will hide the two by two ribbing. It's a very clever way to decorate a rather dull area of your project. Plus it adds some extra warmth around your wrists and some extra bulk at the opening of your sleeve to cut down on the amount of wind and cold that can make its way up your arm. In the class, we got through one cuff and we were left with enough yarn, in theory, to knit the other and do a plain body. That's as far as I got with that project, unfortunately. I haven't been able to get back to them and finish them off, but I really am looking forward to them. It was a really pretty cuff with made with browns and yellows and oranges, and I think that the finished project will be really nice. I just haven't had the time to return to them. That afternoon, I went to Creating the Effect with Fair Isle with Terry Malcolmson. She is a young Fair Isle designer living there on Shetland. She taught us some techniques for selecting colors for our own patterns or for when we want to change up the colors in a pattern designed by someone else. One of the things that several of the teachers shared with us is that when they want to make sure there's enough contrast between two colors, it's not always easy to tell just by holding the two balls of yarn next to each other. Instead, they'll take a strand from each and twist them together. If you can see the colors distinctly in the twist, then the colors will stand out from one another. But sometimes when you twist two colors that look distinctive in the ball, you can't really distinguish them from one another anymore when they're twisted. So that's actually really, that was an interesting little trick to learn. Another tip that was frequently shared is that normally people don't change both colors in the same row of a Fair Isle pattern. So you might change the background color in one row and keep the pattern color the same and then change the pattern color in the following row. It helps the colors blend better. What I enjoyed about Terry's class was that she walked us through her whole process of deciding on what color she was going to use, from finding inspiration to pulling out the colors she thought would work for that inspiration, separating them into pattern colors and background colors, laying out the colors and checking the effect of the pattern and background colors on each other. It was not just a matter of finding a few pretty colors and jumping into swatching. Once she had them in a potential order, then she would start swatching with them and see how the colors worked out. Saturday was my last class. It was a mitts along with Felicity Ford or Felix Ford who introduced us to her Knitsonic method of design. Rather than just looking for color inspiration, we were also looking for pattern inspiration. So we were all given a bag of wool and a photograph of a cliff face, and we were meant to look for colors and shapes that we could then simplify and work into a fair aisle pattern. It was a hugely informative class. I can't even begin to sum it up. I was really impressed with her thinking, and she does have a few books out about the method that I will link to in the show notes. I picked up a couple of them and they are on their way to me (laughs) with the box of books that I shipped at the end of Wool Week that still haven't made it. One thing I will share that I really loved is that when she is working, she will often just dive into a project by knitting a pair of fingerless gloves. 
In the first one, she tests out shapes and color combinations based on her inspiration. Then she'll look at that finished mitt and analyze what worked and what didn't. The next glove will draw on the positives and seek to resolve the negatives. She then said she usually just has that set of mismatched mitts. But if we were happy with the second one, we could go on to make a match for it. I do think it's a lovely thought to have a set of mismatched fingerless gloves that show your ongoing design process, though. And that's that. You have now come with me on my Wool Week adventures. Last episode, we covered the experiences. And this one covered the classes. It was a really magical week. By the end of it, I felt like a kid coming home from a classroom Christmas party, though. I was so tired and overstimulated. I think scheduling fewer things will help with that next year. But really, the idea of being around so many fellow knitters is a pretty thrilling thing in general. We will take a break for one more song. Again, thinking about woolen music, I did some searching around and I didn't find a whole lot to be honest. There is one song though that I think almost all of you will have heard before, but it's a folk song. And that got me thinking about art and what makes art. And I did some Googling around and found that there is a distinction drawn between art songs and folk songs. Art songs are usually created by a known composer for known performers. They are typically how we classify classical music forms, but it reaches more broadly than that. Creators of folk songs are lost to time. The songs were passed along from person to person. They tend to address everyday subjects. And I thought, what better song form to draw from? when someone is talking about wool and art in a podcast about knitting, than a folk song. They are both passed from person to person, with origins lost to history. They both belong to all of us as part of our cultural heritage. So very fitting. So with that in mind, I play for you now. Ba Ba Black Sheep. <laughs> A few more things before I go. After Wool Week, we spent a week in the Highlands before Loch Ness Knit Fest began, and I'll tell you about that in a coming episode. But next week, you should hear the interview I did with Hazel Tyndall. She is the world's fastest knitter and has been for over a decade now, but we did not talk about that at all. I thought she might be tired of talking about it, and I know she's done lots of interviews about being speedy in the past, so I used the opportunity to learn more from her about knitting on Shetland in the past and present. I think you're really going to enjoy that interview. Finally, I would like to host a knit along in January, and I want to give you a heads up about that. I'm still working out the details, but one thing I know is that I would like there to be some prizes. So if you are a designer or a yarn store owner or a dyer or a maker of notions and would like to contribute to the prize list, please reach out to me at Anne at familypodcasts.com. That's Anne with an E, remember? I'll get into the whys in a future episode, but the premise of the knit along will be kept very simple so everyone can join in on this one. The goal will be to spend January tackling your unfinished objects. I'll work out some different categories for prizes, but keep this in the back of your mind as you're tackling your holiday knitting. There will be a chance to clean out the cobwebs of your UFO bin coming up. In the meantime, thank you for listening and knitting with me for a bit. 
if you would like to contact me, you can email me at Anne at familypodcasts.com. That is Anne with an E at familypodcasts.com. I'm on Ravelry, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube as I thought I knew how. If it's a place that allows you to put spaces between the words, then there are spaces between the words. Otherwise, it's all one word. The Facebook and Ravelry groups are both called I Thought I Knew How Podcast, and I'm on Twitter as at thought I knew how. The website for this show is I thought I knew how dot familypodcasts.com. There you will find the show notes for each episode. Every now and then I post a blog post there too. Remember to hop over to the Morehouse Merino flock on Facebook to join in on the Harriet's collection knit along. There is still plenty of time to join. You can find the group at www.facebook.com slash groups slash Morehouse Farm. Until next time, may you be blessed with stitches that never drop. Yarn without joins, and plenty of time to knit.